A visit to Mexico is a popular choice for many reasons. It is a country of great ruins, culture, food, and especially beaches. In the United States, so many people talk about Mexico as the perfect holiday haven, filled with palm trees, golden beaches, and delicious restaurants. But other people are too afraid to cross the border. Some parts of Mexico are a constant war zone, and it's all because of the never-ending war on drugs. The Mexican government is trying to contain cartels, and cartels are fighting one another, hoping to come out on top. But this means the violence never stops. In fact, as in 2023, it only seems to rise. So what are Mexico's deadliest cartel regions, and just how deadly are we talking? Let's dive in. Number seven, Tepic Nayarit. Tepic is not Mexico's most dangerous town, but it's definitely not a tourist town. I mean, sure, you can find people juggling machetes for entertainment, but that's about as cool as it gets. Tepic is a very old town. It was founded in 1531, and for many centuries, it thrived due to its sugarcane, tobacco, and citrus fruit trades. This city was founded as something called the Holy Spirit of Greater Spain or something, um, and it was the first capital of the so-called Kingdom of New Galicia, uh, because Galicia, because it was uh, founded by a different colonizer. However, Tepic has become just as famous for its violent crime rates. In 2018, there were about 230 homicides in Tepic. That's 45 for every 100,000 people. Needless to say, that's a lot. To put things in perspective, it's more than twice Chicago's homicide rate, and that's one of the highest in the states. The Beak has an overall crime rate of 66, with particularly worrying numbers for drug dealing, armed robbery, and something no local wants to hear, an increase in crime during the last five years. Why is this happening, you ask? One word, cartels. The more dangerous a region or town in Mexico is, the more cartels are involved. And it gets especially worse when two or more cartels are fighting over that territory, as you're about to see. Number six, Guadalajara, Jalisco. I'm sure you've heard of Guadalajara and Jalisco before. Indeed, two of the most notorious Mexican cartels bear these names. Guadalajara is the birthplace of the first modern day cartel in Mexico. Really, when the Guadalajara cartel came together, It was a group of Mexican drug traffickers saying, OK, let's share our resources. Rafael Carro Quintero, known as the King, was among the first traffickers to establish smuggling routes across the border into the United States in the 1970s. He came from a small village in Sinaloa. Street thug moved up pretty quickly. Smart, though, for somebody with a very limited education, he saw an opportunity. Just like Pablo Escobar in Colombia, Rafael came from a really poor family, and the promise of quick cash and fast cars appealed to him. Soon enough, Rafael met Don Nero and Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, aka El Padrino, or El Efe. El Padrino means the godfather, and El Efe means the boss. These are cool names he made for himself as he established the first ever Mexican cartel, monopolizing the modern drug trade and establishing production and smuggling routes across Mexico and into the US. With the same business savvy and sheer brutality that Escobar showed around the same time, El Padrino became the ultimate kingpin, destroying anyone who laid claim to trafficking routes in the region. The Guadalajara cartel remains one of the most powerful Mexican cartels in history. They ruled by brutality, by killing people who disagreed. And if these names are still unfamiliar to you, El Chapo and El Mayo started their careers in the Guadalajara cartel. Yep. If it weren't for El Padrino, the future Sinaloa cartel kingpins might never have met each other. However, it was because of El Chapo and a few others that the Guadalajara cartel doesn't exist anymore. In 1984, DEA agent Kiki Camarina led a huge mission costing the Guadalajara billions of dollars and threatening to expose their entire operation. A month later, he was kidnapped, tortured, and killed at Rafael Quintero's mansion. The DEA then led their largest operation at the time, Operation Legend. Within five years, all Guadalajara bosses were arrested or killed. In 1989, the cartel split into tinier factions, Juarez, Tijuana, and Sinaloa. 
But as you can imagine, the newer cartels didn't happily share the land equally divided between them. So ever since 1989, there had been constant conflicts in Guadalajara and its surrounding region, Jalisco. Today, Jalisco is home to the horrific conflict between El Chapo Sinaloa cartel and El Mencho's Jalisco New Generation cartel. Indeed, the CJNG is based in Jalisco, and this only amplifies the conflict with the Sinaloa cartel. As with Tepic, the level of violent crime in Guadalajara has been on the rise over the last few years, and the rates are high for violent crimes, murder, and police corruption. In fact, the rate for the latter is 85, among the highest in the world. This means, sadly, a lot of officers are in the cartels' pockets, protecting them instead of the civilians. This only increases the danger of being in that region. Last year, 301 bodies were discovered in the state in 41 clandestine graves, and 544 bodies were found in 2020, the highest number to date. The numbers are bleak. Mexico's murder rate has tripled since 2006, from 9.6 to 28 homicides per 100,000 people, and Jalisco is right there in the middle of it all. Number 5. Aruapan, Michoacan The disturbing facts and numbers of the war between the CJNG and the Sinaloa cartel continue in the state of Michoacan. The CJNG kingpin, Namasio Asegura Carvantes, AKA El Mencho, was born in Agualilla, a small town in Michoacan. This makes him even more obsessed with controlling this region and destroying the claim of any rival cartels. To say the CJNG is violent would be a grave understatement. They began as Los Mata Zetas, or the Zeta Killers, with the goal of destroying the Los Zetas cartel. But Los Zetas was already known as Mexico's most brutal cartel. Here's a very small sample. Most of it is simply too grisly to show. There was the summary of 200 migrants, the casino fire which killed at least 50. The preferred method of killing involves beheading with chainsaws. They also prepare guisos. These are stews where you take a member of the family and you put them in a pig boiler and you pour gasoline on them and then you set a match to them. So El Mincho had to top that. Shockingly, he did. Yorubapan and its surrounding region, Michoacan, was the topic of turf disputes between Los Zetas, the Knights Templar, La Familia Michoacana, Los Viagras, and the CJNG. But during the 2020s, it became clear the CJNG was the top dog. The problem is that didn't stop the violence. Michoacan is the world's avocado capital. Avocado consumption in the United States tripled between 2001 and 2023. Canada imports 100,000 tons of avocados each year. Initially, this was great news for the Michoacan locals. People had jobs and the economy was on the rise. But as soon as the avocado industry began rising exponentially, cartels like the CJNG and Knights Templar began forcing their way in. They attacked farmers, stole their fruit, and extorted their business. Sadly, most of the victims in Michoacan are poor avocado farmers and their defenseless families. Your orchard is sealed off. You have cameras everywhere and you have guns. It's so hard for me to wrap my head around the the protection is all because you are growing this delicious fruit. If you're doing well, they kill you or disappear you or they come and pull you and your family out of your house and they take away your orchard and they cultivate it and take all the money. In a tragic twist, it's our increase in avocado consumption that propels cartels to become more violent in this industry. All this crime is a consequence of the increase of price of avocado. Now all of this has exploded. The extortion, kidnappings, you have to pay for protection. I'm afraid of losing my family or having them lose me. In 2019, the CJNG invaded Uruapan to take control of its booming avocado industry. Within a few days, they left 19 dismembered bodies all across town. Six of them were left hanging from a bridge. Imagine how many people saw the bodies, even kids, before they were taken away. And for the CJNG, this is just a way to scare other farmers into submission. In Michoacan, the avocado industry, first they start like taxing them with like 10% of their gains. And then they say like, why is it not easier just to take over? Give me like the property titles or I, or I will kidnap 
your daughter. I will uh, extort you. If you don't, I'm going to shoot you. There are 700 daily operations in Michoacan alone just for the protection of the avocado industry. But some of these end with murder, too. They've been dropping bombs from the drones. And we have the military right here, but it does seem like they're, they're interested in something stopping the other guys from uh, dropping all those bombs. They're dropping drone bombs just over there? Yeah, that just happened today. They dropped like five bombs today. You're kidding. Yeah. Where? Across the river. Dorua Pond has a staggering murder rate of 78. And over the last five years, the state of Michoacan recorded over 10,000 murders. On March 10th, 2023, CJNG Sicario staged a series of attacks in different towns in Michoacan and used drones to launch bomb attacks against residents in the state. In 2022, one incident made headlines throughout Mexico. The CJNG ambushed a funeral in the town of Michoacan, killing up to 17 people. Then they loaded the bodies into their trucks and drove away. Their motivation is unclear, but that's the problem with cartel violence. People live in constant fear, panic, and confusion. You never know when your life can end in the most brutal way, and your family might not ever understand why. Another bleak fact is that these are murder numbers. Every year, there are hundreds or thousands more who disappear and are never found. Number four, Culiacan, Sinaloa. Coyoacan is a million people metropolitan city and the capital of the infamous Sinaloa region. You guessed, Coyoacan was the birthplace of the notorious Sinaloa cartel, formerly led by El Chapo. He and his partner, El Mayo, laid the grounds of the cartel in the late 1980s as the Guadalajara cartel was coming to an end. At the time, their biggest disputes were with the Juarez and Tijuana cartels, fellow Guadalajara factions. But the violence between the three of them was nothing compared to what is happening today in Sinaloa, thanks to El Chapo's cartel, the CJNG, and the government's relentless war on drugs. In 2019 and 2023, Culiacan was home to some of the bloodiest cartel attacks in Mexican history. And in the center of both stories was El Chapo's son, Ovidio Guzman. In 2019, El Chapo was sentenced to life in prison at the ADX Florence, US's highest security federal prison. For the Mexican government, this was a reason to celebrate. Perhaps the Sinaloa cartel would crumble under his demise, just like the Guadalajara had crumbled after El Padrino's arrest. Sadly, they were wrong. The government knew the Sinaloa cartel was being led by El Chapo's four eldest sons. Judy, they are known as Los Chapitos, the four most trusted sons of the world's most notorious drug kingpin. As the I-Team has reported for several years, federal drug investigators here in Chicago consider El Chapo's sons in charge of the Sinaloa cartel that remains this area's largest trafficker of heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamines. So they had to go after each of Los Chapitos to arrest them and extradite them to the U.S. Of the four, Ovidio was the youngest, but he already had a taste for blood as horrible as his dad's. They now say this drug lord, nicknamed the Mouse, has ordered the murders of informants, a rival drug trafficker and a popular Mexican singer who refused to perform at his wedding. Imagine fearing for your life if you sang at his wedding and fearing for your life if you refused. Ovidio was charged with conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine, white powder, and weed into the U.S. And in 2019, he and his older brother Ivan were just preparing for a massive shipment, five kilograms of coke, a ton of cannabis, and 500 grams of meth. So the Mexican government and the DEA decided to lead a ruthless mission and arrest the two brothers on October 17th. But the results were so messy, that day is now known as Black Thursday. In the early hours of the morning, the military went after Yvonne, but he was one minute quicker. He escaped and rallied up his army, hundreds of sicarios armed to their teeth. An hour or two later, the military surrounded Ovidio's house. When Mexican forces approached Lopez's home, Cartel Guzman opened fire from within. However, after an intensive shootout, they were able to gain entry to the house and apprehend Lopez, who surrendered unarmed. Ovidio initially started shooting at the officers. Of course, the officers fired back, and Ovidio soon realized he was heavily outnumbered. So he came out with his hands up. After an intensive shootout, they were able to gain entry to the house and apprehend Lopez, who surrendered unarmed. The problem was, by now, Yvonne knew what was happening, so he sicked his army on the authorities. Surprisingly enough, it was Ovidio who seemed to try to stop it. But his efforts were too late. It was complete bloodshed. 
The Sicarios released cartel prisoners, set fires to cars to block important roads, and invaded the local airport. Trade and travel were completely stopped in the Sinaloa region for hours. Seven officers and one civilian were killed and the surviving civilians were instructed to hide in their homes. The cartel imposed a curfew on the town until Ovidio would be released. Sadly, it worked. President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador ordered Ovidio's immediate release to prevent further loss of life. This sends the wrong message, that the authorities are easily intimidated and the cartel is in control. The president said people's lives are more valuable than capturing a criminal, but he'd change his opinion four years later when Ovidio would finally be arrested again. In early January 2023, 200 special forces conducted a joint operation and arrested Ovidio Guzman for a second and hopefully final time. The Mexican president has defended the military operation that captured a drug cartel leader, Ovidio Guzman, the son of jailed drug trafficker El Chapo. Violence erupted in Culiacán, a stronghold of the cartel. At least 19 members of the Sinaloa cartel and 10 members of the military were killed. That's right, 29 people died in just a few minutes. There was panic. People ditched their bags and their phones. They ditched everything in order to take shelter. Again, newspapers reported 24 hours of continuous terror in Culiacán. That's what we need to remember. It's not just the murder rates. It's the constant fear people live in, the chaos, panic, and awareness that you could die in the blink of an eye, collateral damage to the cartel's bloody war. Ovidio Guzman was taken to a military helicopter and transported to Atiplano prison, the same high security prison in Mexico that his father had once escaped from. But now the Atiplano prison has much stronger security. It's highly unlikely Ovidio will ever get out, but his brothers are still leading the Sinaloa cartel. And they've made it very clear they don't care about human life. They're willing to cause as much damage as they need to to keep their cartel as Mexico's most powerful criminal organization. Number three, Juarez, Chihuahua, and the Texas border. Here at Hospital 6, there's an execution here at the corner. There's a little girl. I don't know if that's her uncle or father. It's terribly sad that this is happening in Juarez. This is the horrific reality of Juarez. More often, it's how you tell the story. Augustine's boss at Channel 44 is news director Edgar Roman. Journalists in Juarez stay alive because of what they don't say. There is no government authority that will keep you safe in this city. In Mexico, when a journalist gets killed, it will never be solved. Juarez sits on the border between Mexico and Texas, and it's the most populous city of the Chihuahua state. As it turns out, all towns on the Texas border are dangerous, precisely because they're crucial smuggling points, and cartels fight for their control. On the other side of the border lies El Paso, the Texas town which is also known for its drug-related violence. In November 2022, El Paso reached an all-time murder high, with 63 homicides. Mexican cartels and turf fights are also at the center of these murders. But El Paso is nothing compared to the Juarez rates. In 2022, there were 1,034 murders in Juarez, with a population of 1.5 million. That's a murder rate of 68. This is the most dangerous event I've ever had to cover. That's the grenade explosion. On any given day, we don't know if we will be somewhere and lose our life that day. Yeah, as the cartels get their hands on better technology and more expensive military apparel, the violence only increases. Go, go, go. It happened at approximately nine in the morning. They reported at least six shots at the location. In Juarez, anyone can be executed. Rival cartel sicarios, police officers, government officials, and even reporters snooping around. The moment the cartels feel threatened about being exposed, they kill whoever they believe is most dangerous. Once, they shot and killed a news reporter in front of his eight-year-old daughter. He went to take his daughter to school. When they killed him, she saw everything. Uh, she was eight years old when that happened. The dark truth is, most bodies that turn up on the streets of Juarez are not sicarios, but civilians and officers struggling to end the violence. Ciudad Juarez lies on the front line of Mexico's war on drugs, and its people have paid the price. This cemetery has doubled in size in the last decade to accommodate some of the thousands killing this city alone. 
And there are thousands more whose bodies were never found. Day and night, there are people searching for their loved ones and forensic teams hoping to find any remains to bring closure to grieving families. These are pozos de sondeo los que estamos este, realizando, aproximadamente de 60 80 centímetros para poder meter el, el canino, el K9, y que haga la búsqueda. The number of disappeared people is so big, it simply can't be estimated. It's so scary to think about the scale of the war in Juarez City. In 2021, there were 1,412 homicides in Juarez. However, Amnesty International estimates that as many as 95% of violent crimes go unreported. Many areas of Juarez have simply been abandoned as its people are too scared to live here anymore. It's beginning to look like a ghost town. We have two three in that area. At the moment, Juarez and the Chihuahua region are home to the turf wars between the Sinaloa cartel and the Juarez cartel. Sometimes, smaller cartels and the CJNG lead attacks in the area too. But the cause of these deaths is not so much the war between cartels as the war on drugs between cartels and the government. Since the Mexican government declared war on the drug cartels in 2006, over 200,000 people have been killed. 30,000 more are still missing. Yep, this is the brutal reality of the war on drugs. There just doesn't seem to be a solution to this huge problem. An even more horrible side of the story? Violent cartel crimes lead to other violent crimes being normalized. In Juarez, hundreds of girls are disappearing every year. Esto se está repitiendo. De nuevo se están perdiendo las niñas. No se está repitiendo. Nunca ha dejado de pasar. Nunca ha dejado de pasar. Como a, a 19 del mes de enero. Y van 19 jóvenes desaparecidas. Más sin embargo, la fiscalía dice que apenas van tres. Corruption goes hand in hand with violence, and the government tries to cover up the gravity of the situation, and corrupt officers protect criminals instead of civilians. Apparently, many of the poor girls that disappear fall victim to human trafficking, which is another profitable business for the cartels. Las llevan a una casa de seguridad y las dejan ahí ya no 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 puede hacer preguntas ni solo hace su trabajo. Y el negocio de la trata de blancas es 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 algo importante para la organización. Pues en sí es algo importante, pero es parte de es donde agarran también dinero. Sheesh. Number two, Acapulco, Guerrero. Almost topping our deadly list is Acapulco, a beach resort town on Mexico's Pacific coast in the Guerrero region. Acapulco is a town of contrasts. On the one hand, you have the perfect sand, hotels, and beach bars that attract tourists year-round. In the 20th century, it was Hollywood's most popular Mexican playground. Frank Sinatra even wrote a song about it. On the other hand, though, you have news reports classifying it as Mexico's most dangerous city. Now it is one of the most violent cities in all of Mexico. I've covered wars all over the planet, and uh, this kind of savagery right out in the open is, even to me, shocking. The problem is, the tourist part of the city is not separated from the violent areas, despite what the officials say. The violence in Acapulco is not on the touristic city. So just a few hours after the Vice Attorney General told us there's very little crime in the tourist areas, there's been a murder here on one of the main avenues in the city, which is not far from the beach. The victim, a 54-year-old family man who owned a small food stand in this mall. For a long time, the Beltran Lebia cartel had complete control of Acapulco. But by 2010, the cartel kingpins were arrested or dead. As per usual, the cartel broke into smaller warring factions. The independent cartel of Guerrero and La Beradora were among the cartels fighting for this territory. But during the 2020s, the Sinaloa cartel emerged victorious after backing La Baradora to destroy the independent cartel. You might think, okay, if the Sinaloa has monopolized the region, then the violence can stop, right? Well, no. There will always be other cartels wanting a piece of the pie, and the Sinaloa cartel is determined to keep authorities at bay. This means there are constant shootouts with the police, and sometimes they result in collateral damage. In April 2023, two tourists were killed in a shootout in Acapulco Center. The third person in the group was also shot, but survived. A witness said the victims had arrived in Acapulco the day before for the Easter week vacation. 
She said the victims were on two all-terrain vehicles when assailants rode up on a motorcycle and opened fire on them. The victims' bodies were found still aboard the ATVs. In a tragic twist, the violence has only increased in 2023. There were murders happening almost every single day, and reporters aren't even allowed to film or document all of them. In the end, we witnessed six homicide scenes in four days, and that doesn't even include the ones we were told were too dangerous to film. Acapulco is now known as one of the most dangerous places in the whole world. In 2020, it was classified as the world's third deadliest and most dangerous city. The murder rate stands at 105. Needless to say, this is destroying the tourism business, and lots of people are deserting their hometown in hopes of a safer life. Just like Juarez, Acapulco is slowly becoming a ghost town and graveyard of thousands of unidentified victims. Y son las 3 de la tarde o 2 de la tarde y donde vivas se escuchan balazos. Donde estés y sabes que murió alguien. Y si sabes que murió alguien, ni siquiera te acercas, además corres, porque no, no vas a brindar auxilio. Ana's best friend was shot and killed trying to help a victim. Yo creo que entre la balacera, quien la vio, probablemente dijo, es que ella ya me vio, la voy a matar. It's heartbreaking to think the brutality really has no limit in places like this. Cartel assassins don't have a moral code and they don't care how many people they kill. After a certain kill count, taking lives might even become pleasurable for them. And number one, Tijuana, Baja California. Topping the list is not Mexico's, but the world's deadliest region, Tijuana. Tijuana borders San Diego, California, and is part of the beautiful Baja California region in Mexico. But it's also a hub of cartel activity, wars, and constant violent crimes. Tijuana is considered the most dangerous place in the entire world, and its murder rate is somewhere between 105 to 138, according to various records. In Tijuana, police officers die just because they're police officers. 27-year-old police officer was shot outside his house while leaving for his job. Two suspects have been arrested, but the investigation continues. Tijuana is the hometown of the notorious Tijuana cartel. It was one of the three factions split from the Guadalajara cartel in the late 1980s. From its beginning, the Tijuana cartel was led by the Ariano Felix family, which is El Padrino's family. His two nephews, Ramon and Benjamin Ariano Felix, took over the cartel in 1987. Today, Benjamin is in prison with a life sentence, and his little brother was killed by a police officer on El Chapo's payroll. The Ariano Felix family is a large one, and it seems like Anadina, aka La Efe, or the boss, has been in charge of the Tijuana cartel for a while. However, Anadina is a quiet figure who resorts to violence only as a last resort. So it's not her cartel that's causing the most ruckus. Nope, it's once again, the Sinaloa cartel. The Sinaloa and Tijuana cartels have been enemies since the very beginnings in 1987. But today, it seems like Tijuana is small potatoes compared to Los Chapitos organization. Tijuana is a constant war zone. Its streets more ravaged than many cities that are actually at war. That's because cartel sicarios have no problem with killing people in broad daylight. Sometimes they proudly display mutilated bodies to instill fear in people and intimidate rival cartels into submission. Jorge Luis Gonzalez is dead, shot in the head. His sister is disconsolate. Some people can't even afford to bury their loved ones properly, so they just end up in a public cemetery, piled up on top of each other. Many others are never identified, so they're just dumped on the same grounds with a simple cross next to them. Some of the city's poorest residents are buried in this public cemetery in eastern Tijuana. Those homicide victims whose bodies are not claimed or cannot be identified are sent to the common grave, buried in wood coffins stacked a half dozen deep. This is the reality for so many people in Tijuana and Mexico. They live in constant fear for their and their loved ones' lives. Then, when they die, they're quickly forgotten and thousands of others make the headlines every single year. Cartels are a disease that is ravaging entire regions in Mexico and turning once luxurious cities into ghost towns. And the government's war on drugs seems to make it all worse. So is there any end to the violence or can these deadly regions be saved? Hey, thanks for watching. 
What do you think about today's video? What other dangerous places in the world do you know of? Write us a thoughtful comment and before you leave, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time and stay safe.